to hide this weary soul this bag of bones I tried with all my might but I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting a vagabond and just when I ran out of the road I thank the Savior because he healed my heart. He changed my name forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. I thank God. I cannot deny what I've seen. Got no choice but to believe. My doubts are burning like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friends. Burden and bitterness, you can just keep it moving. Well, you ain't welcome here. From now till I walk the streets of gold, I'll sing of how you saved my soul. This wayward son has found his way back home. ground i thank the master i thank the savior because he healed my heart and changed my name forever free i'm not the same i thank the master i thank the savior he picked me up and turned me around and placed my feet on solid ground i thank the master i thank the savior because he healed my heart and change my name forever free i'm not the same i think the master i think the savior i thank god he picked me up he turned me around he placed my feet on solid ground i thank the master i thank the savior he healed my heart and change my name forever free i'm not the same i thank the master i thank the savior i thank god amen There is now a hope that lasts beyond our days. For the one who once was buried lives again. Now the tomb is bare and empty and the stone is rolled away. Praise the risen one who overcame the grave. All you broken hearted, all you worn and weak. Come find living water, everlasting streams. To the wandering spirit, lost and searching, wanting something more. Find the risen King who overcomes the world. Let there be dancing in the darkness and let our song ring through the night. Lift your voice and sing that Christ is King for Jesus is alive. Amen, church. No more condemnation, no more doubt and fear. For our sin and shame, they have no power here. 
In his resurrection, perfect love has set the captives free. Praise the risen King who stands in victory. Let there be dancing in the darkness, and let our song break through the night. Lift your voice and sing that Christ is King, for Jesus is alive. Let there be dancing in the darkness, and let our song break through the night. Lift your voice and sing that Christ is King, for Jesus is alive. Hallelujah, death is undone, hallelujah, Jesus has won, hallelujah, we overcome, oh in Jesus, oh in Jesus, hallelujah, death is undone, hallelujah, Jesus has won, hallelujah, we overcome, oh in Jesus, oh in Jesus, hallelujah. Death is undone, hallelujah. Jesus has won, hallelujah. We overcome, oh, in Jesus, oh, in Jesus. Let there be dancing in the darkness, and let our song break through the night. Lift your voice and sing that Christ is King, for Jesus is alive. Let there be dancing in the darkness, and let our song break through the night. Lift your voice and sing that Christ is King, for Jesus is alive. Lift your voice and sing that Christ is King, for Jesus is alive. Amen, church. You know, that first song that we were singing as you came in this morning is called I Thank God. And I know our youth girls had that as a big part of their conference that they went to last uh, in, in the wintertime back, back in February. But in the first verse of that song, it talks about our tendency to wander, to hide, our desire to accomplish things in our own power. And more often than not, we realize that that's just sure to fail. Um, it's in those times that we either choose to lean into God for help or we drift away. And that prideful attitude of doing things on our own way is called sin. And uh, getting back into Romans, um, Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. But thanks be to God that, as we just sang, Jesus is alive. It is that truth and that hope that assures us of the second half of Romans 6.23 where it says, But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when we feel we are at the end of our road, when we are tired, beaten down and bruised, God, the Lord Almighty, the King of creation, comes alongside us to remind us that we aren't there alone, or that we aren't alone, that he's there to help us. We can stand firm and walk on solid ground. It's his great love for us that is why we sing hallelujah, praise the Lord. He has accomplished much for us through Jesus Christ. So in celebration of that, let's lift our voices in praise together and sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation.
Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you befriend us, that you walk alongside us. When we're on a mountaintop, you're there. When we're in the valley, you're there. For that, we can give you, we can't give you enough praise. So, Father, I pray that as we have had an opportunity to stand together and worship the Lord God Almighty, the King of creation, this morning, that it was pleasing to you and that it brought you the glory and the praise and the honor that you so much deserve. Father, thank you so much for sending your Son, Jesus Christ. Our sin could not go without payment, and he paid that price. But Father, thank you so much that it doesn't end there, that we have the victory over death and eternal life through his resurrection, and Jesus is alive. We are so grateful. So as we end this prayer, let's declare together, church, that Jesus is alive. On three. One, two, three. Jesus is alive. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning, church. It's great to see you all this morning. I am glad we're all here. How many of us have started school over the last week or two weeks? Lots of hand. College? Yes. Okay, cool. Lots of school starting. We're glad you're here. We know that that's, um, it is what it is for students. We know that it is what it is for parents, too. So welcome back to the school year. Uh, my name is Jason Simon. I'm the minister to students here at the church, which means I oversee our youth and our college programs. I'm up here this morning just to give you a few quick announcements. We hope that uh, you found a warm welcome with us this morning, whether you're here in person or you're joining us um, online. Uh, if you are here and you would love to um, connect with our church, if you have questions, uh, if there are ways that we as a church can serve you, um, if there's ways we can come alongside you in whatever season of life you're in, if that's plugging in deeper here, if it's plugging in um, in a greater way to the community. If you're here with us in person, you can just scan that QR code that's on the pew back in front of you. If you're with us online, you can... Uh, uh, find all the information there on our website with how to get in touch with us. But we're really grateful you're here. We look forward to connecting with you. We hope that you find here, amongst lots of other things, at the root of it, uh, people who are just committed and devoted to following the way of Jesus in, in every way that we can. And um, that looks like being uh, really committed to discipleship and walking the path of growing in our faith and growing what we know about the Lord and how we um, share in the community. It looks like being devoted to healing, whether that's um, healing that the Lord does in us or uh, we take that out into the community. Um, we have renewal programs that meet here and things like that. We are committed to being a people who actually allow the word of Christ to dwell in us richly and change us and make us new. And justice. We are committed to being a people who are passionate about justice and the many forms that that looks like. Uh, one big way that looks here at the church is um, advocating for foster care and adoption and supporting families in that world. There's a myriad of other ways that that flows out from that. So we pray you find those things here, but at the base of all of them, just the people who are passionate about following Jesus every way that we can. If you do want to know more um, about who we are, like I said, reach out. But there's also something coming up next Sunday. It's a really good opportunity for you to plug in. It's called Get to Know UBC. Um, it'll be a lunch after church where our staff will be present there. Um, our pastor will be there. We'll have a lunch and we'll just, um, if you have questions about membership or just the heart of our church, we would love to meet with you there. Uh, because we provide lunch, we would ask that you would register for that. You can do that online. You can email Caroline. You can just find one of us after the service. We would love to follow up with you. There's a welcome center about halfway down the three-mile hallway, and you can stop in there for refreshments and then talk to a staff member if you have questions about that. Um, we take the fourth Monday of every month as a church, and we um, devote that to prayer and fasting. We, we, we invite you to join us as we do that. There's no requirement here, just a deep invitation. Um, it's a day when the leadership of our church, our deacons meet um, to talk through numerous things with the congregation, and we just spend the day in prayer and fasting for them. So that is coming up, uh, I, I believe tomorrow, right? It's the fourth Monday of August. So we'd invite you to join us with that. If you have questions, again, we'd love to give you more information about that. I mentioned a little bit last week about our college ministry. Um, I wanna do that again, just so that you as a church know all that's happening. And because we have a lot of students who are coming back to campus, maybe for the first time, or maybe are returning, um, you may not know this church. There's a, a page in your UBC News that kind of outlines some ways that 
our college ministry functions not just here in the church, but through the church. So we are able to support a lot of campus ministries. So um, as a church, there's a lot of rules with what we can and can't do on college campuses around. Uh, the groups that have a lot more access to campus are college ministries. So places like the Baptist Student Ministry, Student Mobilization, and organizations like that. Um, just Friday, we had one of those groups, International Christian Fellowship, who we support. Um, we, we give them a space to use and things like that. They had a cultural dinner. They ministered to international students across the street. Um, they had 110 students in our college house right here across the street, which is really incredible. Um, meeting those students, getting them connected. I mean, these are people who come from all over the world. A lot of them just don't even have community here at all. Uh, but then sharing the gospel and making follow-up appointments to walk through discipleship with those students. So when you give to the church, I want you to know those are the things that you're supporting. 110 students eating here last week is pretty incredible. We've got a college lunch today I'll talk about in a minute. So thank you. Whether it's in person, um, here in the boxes as you walk out, whether you give by mail or debit or um, you give online, we're just super grateful. Um, thank you all. I'm very grateful. Thank you so much for the way that you partner with this church and you support it. Um, going from that, we do have a college lunch today. So if you're a college student in here, um, if you've got friends who could use a free lunch, we are having free lunch today. Um, it'll be in a house right across the street, that same house. We call it our college house. We do a lot of our stuff out of that. So if you go out, you just go straight across the street. We'll be over there directing you. We're going to have a free lunch there today. Um, just a place for you to get to know us. Um, and if you don't want to get to know us and you just want to grab a free lunch and go, there, there's no shame in that. I did that in college. We love the free food. So there's tons of free food over there. Meet us over there immediately after the service. And then Thursday night, our Bible study starts. It's called The Table. This is our college Bible study. Um, it's at 7 o'clock in room 200. You just kind of walk down the sidewalk here on Wabash. We'll have signs and stuff to point you where to go this Thursday. We hope you'll join us for that. And then um, lots of avenues for discipleship, uh, getting plugged in with families here in the church for students. A lot of that information is here in your UBC News. So do, join us for that. Um, this week kicks off all of our midweek stuff, so Wednesday night stuff. So if you're not a college student and you've tuned out, tuned back in for a minute, we've got um, stuff for families, stuff for kids. We've got stuff for adults. We have uh, renewal that meets every Wednesday night for adults. We're going to have Theology Matters, which Pastor Jeremiah will talk about here in a few minutes. Uh, we'll have group, which is our Wednesday night Bible study for our high schoolers and our middle schoolers. We'll have midweek, which is our Wednesday night program for our, our young students. So y'all come on this Wednesday. Um, all that stuff kicks off at 630. We'd love to see you here today. So we're kind of moving closer to today, if you can tell. Today at 5 o'clock, um, we have a business meeting. It's in person here at the church. Um, so if you're a member, this is where we're going to go over um, some quarterly business meeting things, um, the budget and things like that. So we would invite you to join us in Harris Hall. That meeting will start at 5. So if you could be here a little early for that, we would love it. Um, love for you guys to be involved in the life of the church and, and all those decisions that we make there. But to sweeten the deal after church today, because there is a business meeting, we're going to have popsicles. So come join us for popsicles and then be all sweetened up for the business meeting tonight. So we hope that you'll do that. Um, again, as you just walk down the hall, it'll be in the Welcome Center. You'll see everything set up there. Um, you can find more information. Your UBC News, if you didn't get one when you came in, they're posted at both of the entrances. Grab one of these on your way out. It outlines all that stuff and more. So church, we're grateful you're here. You made it through the announcements. Way to go. Great job. College students, we'll see you for lunch after this. Um, and right now, we'll invite our kids down for our children's message. Miss Martha up. So here we go. Kids, y'all can come on down. Come on down, boys and girls. Good morning. This is the time for all kids pre-K through fifth grade and their parents. If you want to come on down too, you're always welcome to come and be a part of the children's message as we all learn together. Good morning, boys and girls. It's so good to see you. Are we doing good today? Yes, awesome. Okay, well, I have good news for you today. Are you ready? Today, you are going to find out in this children's message what is the most important thing about you. Are you excited? It's a big day. We're going to find out what is the most important thing about us, the way we were made. But I am going to need a little help today from a volunteer, and it has to be a volunteer that can read Egyptian. I'm just kidding, just English. So, <laughs> Eleanor, you want to come read? I promise I won't throw Egyptian at you, okay? All right, so Eleanor is going to be my helper. You just stand right here. Now, we're going to have some scriptures on the screen. You can look here or there. And if you could read this first scripture for me, that would be great. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. Very good. Thank you. And if you can read this next one, that would be great too. 
So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Thank you. All right. Didn't she do a great job? Thank you, Eleanor. You stay right here because I have another one for you in just a moment. Okay. Eleanor, did you hear a word repeated in both of these scriptures? Maybe that you said in Created. Both. Created was in there. And God. Y yes, God was in there. Any in, other word? In his image. Yes. In his image. Ding, ding, ding. That was the word I was looking for. So thanks for reading my brain. Image. Today we are learning the most important thing about us, and that is that we were made in God's image. But what does that mean? Has anybody, like, ever seen God? Ever, like, gone to lunch with him? Taken him out for coffee? No, you shouldn't be drinking coffee. But no. <laughs> what does God look like? What does his image on us mean, created in God's image? Well, today I brought something to help us learn what it means to be created in God's image. Eleanor, what have I brought for us today? A mirror. Yes, a mirror. All right, so since I don't have mirrors for everybody, you're going to get to do the sign language for mirror. Everybody hold your hand up and wiggle it like this. Mirror, okay? Anytime I say the word mirror today, we're going to do the sign language for mirror, okay? Eleanor, what does a mirror do? Um, it gives you an image of yourself. Yes, like a reflection, yes. right? An image of yourself, right? So we are going to use the mirror today to help us learn what it means for our life to mirror or reflect God's image. And there's two things I want to teach you today about us mirroring the image of God in our life, okay? The first one has to do with something with our hands. Can you take your hands and shake your own hands? Say, hi, nice to meet you, self. All right. <clears throat> We're going to talk about relationships. One way that we mirror the image of God in our life is through relationships. And Eleanor just read, there is an important relationship that's been there from the beginning. And that was our relationship with God. Can everybody shake your hands? Your relationship with God. Because he made you from the beginning. That relationship's been there the longest of all of them. And that is a way that our life mirrors the image of God is for us to have a relationship with God. But there is a second relationship that is important too. Eleanor, could you read this next screen for me? So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth. Thank you, Eleanor. That's all the reading you have to do today. So thank you, everybody, giving up for Eleanor. Awesome job. So did you hear that? That verse is all about our relationships as male and female together, the way God designed for us to have relationships with people. Can everybody say that? Relationships with people. It's another way that we reflect or mirror the image of God in our life. So let's go over all the ways now that you know that we mirror the image of God in our life. What was the first one? Our relationship with God, right? And our relationship with people, that's right. And we're supposed to have these relationships perfect. But how are we doing out there in the world? Thumbs up or down? Are we having perfect relationships with God and people and like taking care of the earth and all the things he said? Yeah, Hayes. Thumbs down. It's not going well out there. And truthfully, it's because even though, look right here, we were made in the image of God, human beings, we failed. I did, Peter. It is broken. Yeah. Our image was broken. We failed. We were made in the image of God, but it was broken. See, even though he made us in his image, people decided, and even you and I sometimes decide, that we're not going to have our image in God. We decide that we're going to try to find our own way and do things and find our image in other things. Like sometimes we try to find our image and our identity and our achievements and being like the best at this sport or the best at this talent, right? Or sometimes we want everybody to just really like us 
at school, you've been there two weeks, aren't there friends that you're just like, why don't they like me, right? And we really, really want them to like us more than we want God to like us. Sometimes we've even found our identity in our feelings or our emotions that can lead to confusion because then we make decisions based on them and we're not even seeking God and what he wants for our life. So even though God made us in his own image, we took matters into our own hands and now our reflection is broken. Our reflection of him is broken. And when we do all those bad things that I talked about, and there's lots more, it's called sin. It's going against God's will for our life. Now, this mirror, Peter said it, it is broken. I, I broke it. And I don't think there's any way that I can put this mirror back together. Do you think that can make it perfect again? I think with super glue, you'd probably still see all these cracks, right? It would never be a brand new, beautiful mirror again. It's almost like we need a do-over, right? It's almost like we need someone to show us how to have a perfect relationship with God and a perfect relationship with people. So who did God send who showed us how to do that? Jesus, that's right. He sent us someone who was unbroken. He sent us Jesus who showed us how to have the perfect relationship with God, the perfect relationship with people. And he showed us how to do this in his life, how to be the image of God because you want to know what? Jesus was God, and he came, and because he was so perfect, he was then the perfect sacrifice on the cross, and he took all of those ways we had tried to make our own identity and our own image, and he took it on the cross. And when Jesus died and he was buried, he buried our failures, he buried all of our, unbro our brokenness, and so when he was raised to life, when we believe in Jesus, guess what, boys and girls? we can be an unbroken image of God. And in fact, the Bible says that if we look to Jesus, he can show us how to have a perfect relationship with God, a perfect relationship with people, so that we can have the most perfect image of God because we're recreated in the image of God, and it's such a gift to be created in that image. And now we get to follow Jesus and learn how to do that every day of our life. So we're going to pray in just a minute to thank God for that. But boys and girls, I always like to say when I can, if you don't know about having a relationship with God, it's like my favorite thing to talk about. So if you would like to talk to me about it later, I would love to talk with you about it. So let's pray and thank God for making us in his image. Lord, we love you. We thank you for creating us in your image. What a gift, what a privilege to be made in your image so that we can have relationship with you and relationship with others. And I pray that we learn each day how to have those relationships better as we follow you and seek you. We thank you for Jesus and how he took our, own unbro our brokenness to the cross and made us whole so that we can have a relationship with you again. We are so grateful for that. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Let's stand together.
pray together. Father, what a beautiful declaration to say that we can't help but cry out holy. We can't help but cry out worthy. And I pray that that uh, sentiment that we have sung about today would be reflected in our lives, um, not just when we gather together in this sacred space, but throughout each and every day of the week. God, when you lead us to different places and circumstances, be it at school or at home or at work, different relationships. God, that we would be able to truly, even in those settings and in those circumstances, keep our eyes fixed on you and the way in which we walk, the way in which we speak, the way in which we live would reflect a desire to bring you glory and honor, to help others see your worthiness. And God, we confess that too many times we uh, get in the way of that, we get distracted and we often turn our eyes towards other things. And so help us allow this moment to be a refocusing of our hearts, a recentering of our minds, to truly gaze upon you. God, what an incredible gift to come and to read the sacred text that has existed for thousands of years and guided your saints, your people. May we treasure this moment and cherish it. May your spirit guide us. God, use me as only you can. Position us and open our hearts to hear what it is that you have to say today, that you would truly allow us to look upon Jesus and Jesus alone. For it is in his mighty, strong, precious, and amazing name that we pray these things this morning. Amen and amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. Thank you, uh, worship team, for leading us beautifully as you always do week after week. Uh, Lots of things that we're going to continue to cover this morning. It's good to see you all. How's everyone doing this morning? You doing well? Good, good. It's good to see you all this morning. A um, couple of updates that I want to elaborate on as we prepare to go to the scriptures is just the reminders you heard in the announcements. I know you all are excited. I know that you all have been sitting around just like with bated breath, eagerly wondering when would be the next church business meeting. Y'all, it's finally here. It's finally arrived. I know you're excited. Tonight is your night, 5 o'clock. Uh, church business meeting. want to make sure that you do uh, uh, create some space to come to that if you're able. You know, one of the things that I think is so unique about our church and the way that we govern ourselves is we, we can joke about church business meetings, but uh, it's neat because a lot of other churches and a lot of other structures, the, the way that they govern and make decisions is they essentially pick one person or a small group of people and they say, you make the call and, and just go. Uh, what's unique about our Our church structure in particular is we're congregationally governed, and that means that everyone has a voice in this. And so uh, that's not just because we believe in a democratic or or a representative form of of governance and decision-making, but because we believe in the priesthood of the believer, that the Spirit of God that's at work in you is the same Spirit that's at work in me, and we have a chance to come together as a community of faith and prayerfully consider where he is leading us. And so that's a big part of what we'll be doing tonight. Uh, historically, over the last couple of years, we've done that in, uh, over Zoom. Tonight, we'll be in person back up here at 5 o'clock. So if you're able to join us uh, as we give consideration of where God's leading us, we'd love for you to do so. You also heard it mentioned earlier uh, during the announcements that this week starts the beginning of our mid- midweek services. We've got some great things happening in our children's ministry, our youth ministry. If you've got kids <clears throat> in those age ranges, be sure and bring them back. As those things get started this week, we also have great things happening for our adults. Uh, Renewal always meets on Wednesdays, and when we talk about being a church that's committed to discipleship, healing, and justice, that's a huge avenue where we try to foster and promote advocacy for healing. Whatever you're carrying in your life, uh, there's a place for you to come in and and share those things and find that sort of support and encouragement. Uh, We've got discipleship groups that meet on Wednesday night, and then something new that we're launching this year, uh, starting this Wednesday, is Theology Matters, so that if you're an adult and you're thinking, well, I don't really know that I want to go to renewal, I don't really 
feel ready to join a discipleship group or maybe my discipleship groups meet on a different day of the week, then you want to come in on Theology Matters on Wednesday night. That it will be a great opportunity for you to come and continue the conversation of what we're talking about on Sunday mornings. Uh, this is basically an extension of whatever we're going to be discussing this Sunday prior to that Wednesday. <clears throat> And so it gives us a space to, to dig a little bit deeper into the subject. But what I want you to know, setting some expectations, is that it's not like sermon number two, okay? So don't come prepared for a lecture or a, a really in-depth uh, exposition from me. I want this to be very informal. I want it to be casual. I want it to be conversational. I want to be able to hear from you what are the questions that you have. What are some things that are resonating with you? What are some things that you would maybe want to seek greater clarity on? Let's just dialogue together. I will have some additional things that I can share, but love for you to be able to come and participate in that if it interests you. If you have questions about what we've talked about so far concerning this series in the image of God, go ahead and send them to me. You can email them to me uh, at my email address, and I'd love to know those in advance. I can keep those anonymous if you prefer, but we will have that as a regular rhythm throughout the fall to have these conversations on Wednesday night to follow up as a message to the Sunday sermon. So hopefully uh, that interests you, and for those of you that are looking for something to do on Wednesdays, you see the myriad of opportunities that we're providing here at the church to pursue those things. So all that being said, uh, we're in the middle of this new series that we started a couple of weeks ago on identity. And, and this is all tied to this greater theme of living the courageous life, and the whole idea is that it's going to be really difficult for you to know uh, who you are, or it's going to be very difficult to live courageously if you don't have a good sense of self and who you are. And so we've been talking a lot about how do we get that sense of identity. We introduced this series by just presenting the nature of the question, right, that everybody tends to find themselves asking at some point or another that, that very important question of who am I? It's that existential question, why do I exist? Uh, what's, what's meaning and significance found in? What, why do I uh, find myself on this planet? What, it's those, those common questions that every uh, human tends to evaluate at some point or another. And so what we saw in Ecclesiastes 3.11 is that God has set eternity in the hearts of mankind. Right? That you're, you're questioning the, the inherent question about why you exist or where to find meaning. Who you are is driven because you're longing for something that lasts. You're essentially asking about eternity. You're longing for the eternal. And God has placed that sense of, of eternity in your heart because he has his imprints on you. And that's how we introduce this subject and the concept of being made in the image of God. But before we went to Genesis 1, like we're going to today, we took a little bit of time last week to say, well, how do we typically answer that question? Or at least how are we currently answering that question in our culture today? How do we look out and see people answering the question of identity and, and who they are and how they find meaning and significance? And we ultimately identified that it seems to be a lot of times an element of crisis, right? That we're struggling to come up with meaningful answers in that regard. And so we talked about the shift that has taken place as it's outlined there in Romans chapter 1. In particular, that we have no longer looked to find some sort of answer for meaning or an understanding of authority beyond ourselves, but now we look within ourselves. That's the shift that's talked about in Romans chapter 1. And so what we try to uh, identify is there's this tendency to think about the difference between the material world in the spiritual world, that those two things are separate, that we have a soul that exists in our body, but they're really different, right? And so now what we give prioritization to and authority to is this inner self, this inner voice that we listen to to help find meaning and significance. And what scripture says is, no, you can't separate those two. They're one and the same, that the gospel comes for all of it. And what we get to see in Psalm 139 is that we see this reaffirmed when the psalmist says, God created your inmost being. That inner voice, that soul, he created. You're, everything is created in his image. And so we need to stop looking within, but we need to look beyond. And so that's all kind of a precursor to what becomes the very foundational text that we have in Genesis chapter 1 that gives us a very critical understanding of identity, which is being made in the image of God. So today, we get to finally look at Genesis 1. Now here's where we're going. Today we'll take a look at Genesis 1 in these first few verses. Um, the next couple of weeks are going to give us the opportunity to look at the implications of being made in the image of God. Okay, today we just get a chance to look at the understanding, the basic elements of it. In the subsequent weeks, what we'll see is that this has profound implications on our understanding of human worth, uh, whether that's self-worth, self-dignity, or human rights. Right, major implication. That's what we'll talk about next week. The following week, two weeks from now, 
after that, we'll see that it has significant implications on our understanding of work, of purpose, how we interact with the created world and our responsibility within the created world. And then three weeks from now, we'll talk about how it has a tremendous impact on our understanding of relationships, how we engage with one another in every single different capacity, whether that's the intimate relationships of, of husband and wife or just overall male and female, society as a whole, but that it is a relational implication. And after we work through those three implications, uh, we'll conclude this series by looking at how Jesus brings all of it to great fruition, right? That, that Jesus, being in the image of God, restores all these things in a very profound way um, that only he can. And so that's, that's where we're headed. Um, today, we're going to just focus in on some of those key ingredients. If, if I were to give you a, a, a simple analogy, imagine through the course of the series we're trying to bake a cake. Right, my, my daughter loves baking. We're always baking things in our house right now. It's like we got muffins and cookies just everywhere. Um, and so the, the point is, is that if you're about to sit down and bake a cake, the first step is you got to get the ingredients. That's what today is, right? So today it's like, let's get the ingredients. Let's figure out what this means. Let's understand these terms and this concept. And through the course of the series, we'll really see how it all comes together. Does that make sense? All right, with that being said, uh, turn to Genesis chapter 1. Uh, now, I have, a, I have a tendency of telling you to turn to the Bible and then waiting like 10 to 15 minutes before we actually read the Bible. You guys notice that I do that from time to time? Uh, the media team calls this uh, the pump fake, that I like to pump fake you guys, you know, and be like, hey, we're about to read the Bible. Oh, no, just kidding. We're not really going to do it. Um, and so it's going to take me a second before we get there. But I do that because I like you to be prepared and be ready in case it takes some time to find it. We'll be in Genesis 1. Uh, speaking of pump fakes, though, Happy start of college football season. Can I get an amen? amen? Right, thank you, thank you. I'm right over there, Tommy, I appreciate that. Uh, it, I love college football. I love football in general. It's all started yesterday. We had a couple of games. It's pretty exciting. I think we can all admit that the world of college football has drastically changed. Uh, I don't know what conference anyone is in anymore. I feel like it's just totally been turned upside down. You've got conference realignment. You've got the transfer portal. You've got all these things that have drastically changed this game. One of the things that has really kind of poured gasoline on this changing landscape is uh, the NIL rules, okay? If you're not familiar with NIL, it stands for Name, Image, and Likeness. And a brief summary of this is that for, for many, many years, it was not permissible to compensate or pay college athletes anything beyond the scholarship and the money that they got for school. Well, this became an increasingly a tentious situation because college football ultimately emerged into a multi-billion dollar industry. And a lot of these athletes were going, you're, you're benefiting from using my name, my image, my likeness. And I'm not getting anything in return. And that kind of ultimately became a legal dispute and it changed. And now these, these students can be compensated for any time someone uses their name, their image, and their likeness. And I was thinking about that in preparation of this because... Uh, it kind of puts uh, or kind of uh, highlights the central question to this that as an athlete, they're sitting there going, you're taking of something that I've given you, right? My name, my image, my likeness. You're benefiting from it, but what am I getting in return? And I think that's a very critical question that, that kind of introduces this series because if you're going to try to identify some key biblical concepts of who God is, I could make an argument those are maybe the three largest attributes or qualities of God that give us an understanding of who he is. His name, his image, his likeness. Right now, this series isn't going to focus as much on his name. But you start thinking about the sacred uh, meaning behind Yahweh or behind Jesus. Right? And how that reveals who God is. Um, but, but through most of our series, while we won't focus on name, his image, his likeness. And essentially what we see is a foundational text to our existence to scripture, to the gospel, is that God has given us his image, his likeness, even his name to a certain extent. And the question is, so what are you doing in return? We're benefiting from that. We're, we, are, we are reaping the rewards, the advantages of being able to be made in his image and his likeness. What are we giving him in return? That's the kind of question that we're going to seek to explain, not just today, but really throughout this series. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack with it. Let's just take a look at Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 26 and 27 together this morning. This comes in this great word of creation. After God has created so many different things, we get to this crowning moment of achievement in the creative narrative. Here's what it says. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness 
so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Okay, let me explain to you what we're going to be talking about today. If you look at those verses, okay, where we're going to focus a lot of our attention is that opening phrase that says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Okay, we're not going to dive into the details of, so let they may rule over the fish of the, uh, the sea and the birds in the sky. The idea of ruling and dominion, we're going to tackle in a couple of weeks when we start talking about work and our purpose, okay? We're also going to focus a little bit there in verse 27 where it says, so God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. We'll reference to a certain degree the idea of male and female, uh, but not in great depth. That'll come later. Uh, we will also draw from some uh, additional descriptions in Genesis 2 when the time is right to further explain how this influences our understanding of relationships. But for today, if I can narrow it down for you, we're talking about the impact of this phrase, let us make and our image and our likeness, and what does it mean to understand the image of God. Okay, that's how we're going to really try to tackle this. Now, before we get into that, um, let me ask you a question. Why do we care? Like, why do we care what Genesis has to say about this? Why is it a credible source for us to even consider on this question of identity? Like, how do we know it's even trustworthy? How do we establish the credibility of Genesis? I want to begin today by just quickly speaking to those natural questions that can kind of give rise to a certain level of skepticism whenever you read Genesis, because Genesis feels weird, doesn't it? I mean, it's, it's just, it's almost mythical in some ways in which it's presented. And so why do we care what this story has to say? How do we know that it's trustworthy? Uh, well, here are a couple of things that I'd, I'd want to speak to. The, what we're really dealing with whenever you look at the book of Genesis is you're asking questions about origins, right? You're asking a question about the beginning. And, and that's a very natural question for us to ask when you start thinking about your sense of identity. Because what we talked about last week was that you didn't make yourself. So it makes no sense for you to think that you can define your own meaning by looking within. Because anything that's created doesn't get to determine its own purpose, right? The chair doesn't get to say, well, I think I want to do this, right? It, whatever's been created, it gets its meaning from the creator. And so, so you have to stop and go, well, I didn't create myself, right? Raise your hand if you created yourself. Anyone? Okay, didn't think so, right? So then you might think, well, I didn't, but my parents did, right? Like technically... That's how I was born. That's how I came into existence, how I came into being. And there's an element of truth to that. But even still, they didn't really create you. Right? Like, no parent, no set of parents sits down and goes, all right, let's see. Blonde hair, brown hair, what do you want? All right, okay, let's do that one. Okay, let's get, make sure they're six foot eight because we want them to be a basketball player. Let's put that one down. Right? Like, you don't get to create your child. You're given your child. Right? And so none of us have created ourselves. And so what ends up happening is, is that when you really start to engage uh, on that sort of level, you start thinking, well, then where did this all begin? Like, where, where did it all begin? Where did this start? Who was the first one? And we look to questions of origin in all fields because we think that helps us understand present reality. Right? If I can look back to see how things started and what the intent was, that gives me a greater understanding of how things are now and where they need to go. And we do this across all fields, right? Uh, not just in religion. We do this in philosophy. We do this in science. We do this in economics. We do this in medicine, right? Like, if we're in a recession, why? Right? We start looking back. What was the origins of this downturn? Oh, well, we made these decisions here. Therefore, that's influenced our present reality, and this is now how we're going to make future decisions decisions. We do this all the time. So when it starts coming to questions of existence, people get in this trap where they go, well, where did this all begin? Where did this all originate? And so you got a couple different options. Philosophy is going to come up with some philosophical answers like Aristotle's first mover, right? For philosophy, it was, hey, everything seems to be in motion. How did that happen? Well, there must have been someone, a prime mover that got it all started, right? Or or philosophy may come up with like the ontological argument. Things along those lines that help us understand how it all began. Science does the same thing, but in a very different way. Science says, what can we observe? Right? What kind of observable data do we have? 
around us that allow us to draw certain um, hypotheses together and test them out and then develop theories of explanation. And so science has done that. And, and the common theory that begins to take you back to the idea of origin is this idea of a Big Bang, that essentially all matter was reduced down to a singularity, right? This compact singularity that then exploded, and you can see that movement uh, observed through the course of the universe, right? And, or maybe within the development of the universe, you may find things like evolutionary theory that say, okay, human life can be reduced back to these simple beginnings that have evolved over time. And again, right, this is what you see scientifically to help give us an understanding of origins. Now, here's what you struggle with with science, right? And let me be very clear. I believe religion and science fit beautifully together, okay? I'm not antagonistic towards science at all, right? I think it's, it's powerful. I think it's beautiful. I think it, it gives us tremendous insight. But what I would say is that even in those theories, you still struggle with the question of origins. Like, because what created the singularity? Like, where did it start? Right, that first molecule or, or, or piece of matter that developed into evolution, where did it come from? Like, what created matter? What created the material world? What, where did it start? If there, if there was a bang, if there wasn't, how, what, what started that expansion, right? You're still questioning this idea of origin. So here's the point. Philosophically and scientifically, with a really thoughtful journey, you still find yourself going, but where did it begin? Right? You're still trying to find some answer. And it is a mystery, right? So religion enters into the conversation and says, well, let us give you some ideas of where this begins. And, and I would say these are somewhat plausible. Now, some strands of religion are going to say there was no beginning, right? It just always has been and always will be. It's just eternal. This is where you get the idea of reincarnation, the all soul that you just kind of absorb yourself into, right? But a lot of other religions are going to point to this idea of design, of a creator, which science and philosophy help reinforce. It's a plausible consideration, philosophically, scientifically, and religiously, that maybe there was a design, maybe there was a creator that kick-started it all, okay? And so now you have to stop and go, well, then what are these different accounts that have existed from the very beginning of time? How, have, how has human history helped explain the idea that there is a creator, Right? And that's where you start finding your way to Genesis. But Genesis is not the only creation account. Y'all know that, right? There are a lot of other accounts for creation that exist from this same time period, ancient Near Eastern time period, okay? There's a lot of them. And so why do we study Genesis? Why do we feel like it's the more credible of the options? Well, let me, let me tell you some things uh, that, that make us look to it. Let me tell you some things that aren't. Uh, we don't choose the credibility of Genesis based on authorship. Okay, let me explain that to you. First of all, I believe all scripture is God-breathed. I believe God used humanity to, to bring his word into fruition. So, so he is the ultimate author, is what I would believe and what we teach here. But we can see that he uses people along the way to bring that into capacity. So there are certain authors biblically that we find credible like Paul. Right? Paul is an eyewitness to certain events. When he's writing these letters, he has things that he can draw from. So you can draw a certain level of credibility from his epistles and his authorship because it was Paul. Right? That's different with Genesis. And here's the reason why. There's a lot of uh, questions about the authorship for the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. But the point is, regardless of who it would be that you attribute it to, no one can say they were there at creation. Right, like it's not like, well, Bill wrote it and Bill was obviously there when God separated light from darkness, so we can trust it. Like, you don't have that as an option, right? It's, it's a different point in time. So we're not choosing this because of authorship, right? Now, some people skeptically would say, well, the only reason we read Genesis is because of ultimately conquest and geography, right? So here's this way of thinking. There are all these different creation accounts that exist out there they all had their own versions of the story. Well, the Jews, they went into battle. They won these battles. They ultimately became the more influential people. And so their story was the one handed down, and that's why we learn it today. I want to push back on that, gently, if that's you. Um, because, here's what I would tell you, is that these other ancient accounts come from cultures like Egypt, Persia, Babylon, massively influential ancient civilizations. And, and the story of Israel is really marked and founded in slavery and then exile. 
And it's not like it's this Western idea, this, this European American idea. Like it's from the Middle East. The fact that the creation account has been embraced with such an almost, not universal, but such a, a, a broad spectrum of endorsement is really remarkable. Why? The reason is not so much the authorship or conquest or geography, but because of the message. The content itself is very different than what you find in these other creation accounts. Okay, so just very quickly for us to establish some of the uniqueness of Genesis. We don't have time to read all the different creation accounts that are out there from ancient Near Eastern theology. Uh, but here's what I would tell you. There's a lot of similarities if you were to read through them. You're going to find a lot of similarities in the sense that there's going to be a reference to some sort of higher power or powers, a deity uh, that creates uh, humanity. Uh, that you're going to see this, this deity or these gods, they interact with humanity, they speak with humanity, they have sovereign control over human affairs, they separate light and darkness. There's even a lot of versions of a flood. I mean, there's a lot of similarities. Here's where they're different. They're different based on trajectory, number one. Ancient Near Eastern other uh, creation accounts are going to ultimately say that everything was bad, but it's gotten good. And we're on this positive trend towards, towards things of progress and, and things getting better. What Genesis says is things were good and then it got bad. Now, let me stop there for a moment and make the connection to why that's so important for your understanding of identity. If your worldview and your sense of understanding of this world says, hey, ultimately we're progressing well. Like, we have this capacity to continue to improve. I have this capacity to continue to improve. That's going to significantly shape your understanding of self and identity. But if you embrace the idea that things have gone wrong and your only measure of sustainability and dependency is on divine mercy, that's going to be very significant in how you see yourself. Right? Because one's going to prompt you to look within. Another's going to prompt you to look beyond. Right, so that's one major distinction. The second one is this, uh, is it's account for the significance for the creation of mankind. Most of the other ancient Near Eastern creation accounts, the creation of mankind is an afterthought. Like, like it just kind of happens. In fact, in certain settings, it's like man was created as food for the gods. Okay? In Genesis, all of creation has this crescendo towards the creation of mankind. Like, it is massively important and significant. Again, think about the implications of what that says for identity. Right? If your existence is an afterthought or vital in the rest of the world of creation. Right? So what happens is, is that the message of Genesis leaps off the page. It's different. And it resonates with us in a very different way. It shapes us in a very different way and it's very much worth consideration. So this is a plausible reason to come to Genesis 1, right? Because philosophy and science point to the idea of giving consideration to that there might be this design, this, this creative force. And when you look at all your other options, you can embrace these other alternatives, but think about the implications of what those alternatives speak into your existence and your sense of identity. Right? And so this is very different. Mankind is communicated, the creation of mankind is communicated as a very substantial part of creation. That's the first thing that we'll call attention to here in this Genesis 1 narrative. We didn't read all of chapter 1, but what you would notice if we were reading it in its entirety is that the language there in 26 and 27 changed. We have moved from let there be, right, let there be light, uh, let there be sky, let there be land, let there be creatures and all those things to now let us make is different right in this particular day of creation where God is creating these living creatures over and over again he says he creates according to their kind and according to their kind and then he says now we're going to create in my image in our image which is actually another distinction right we now have this this really interesting phrase of let us make in our image this is the only uh, time in creation that something is being made in reference to the image of God, the reference of God. It's a really distinct beginning to explain the creation of mankind. In fact, let me, let me put it in, in place like this. When God comes to create Adam, 
This is from Christopher Watkin. I should introduce this guy. Christopher Watkin has written this great book uh, called Biblical Critical Theory. And, and his, his work is really substantial. I will reference it a lot today uh, in subsequent weeks. And in Theology Matters, a really good source and reference on this amongst many other subjects. And his point is that this is different, right? This is different, and we see this because of the way in which the language is used. But then he, he draws this conclusion. He says, when God comes to create Adam, there is no let the land or let the water. There is no according to their kinds. The message is clear. Human beings are different. It's not yet clear how they are different, but these linguistic markers leave us no doubt that Adam is not just one more animal to roll off the conveyor belt of creation, right? This is different. Stanley Grins offers another very important uh, connection to why the creation of mankind is so important to humanity and our sense of identity. He says, indeed, no assertion moves us closer to the heart of our human identity and our essential nature than does the declaration we are created in the divine image. But how are we to understand this crucial Christian affirmation? And to what does the image of God refer? Now that's a really important question. And whether you're religious or not, uh, thinkers, great thinkers have been asking this question for many, many years, right? What, what makes mankind different, right? Okay, so, so the Bible says image of God, great, but, but what does that mean? Like, what, what is it? What were you going to pinpoint that says, well, this is what makes humanity different than anything else in creation? Here's the, the simpler way to ask it. What separates you from the animals, right? We got any dog lovers out there? Raise your hand if you love dogs. Can I get an amen for my dog lovers? Raise your hand if you love cats. Let's pray for our cat people, okay? <laughs> right, but like, what's different between you and your pet? Like, what makes you different? I mean, I know you could describe it, but seriously, I mean, like, how do you typically answer this question? What creates greater worth and value in you than, than the animals and the rest of creation? Well, here are a couple of different options. This, again, is a good summary that comes in Watkins' book. Uh, he would point out John Locke. Here's what Locke has said, that it's understanding that sets man above the rest of sensible beings, right? You have the capacity to understand things, but even then... I like dogs understand, sit, and lie down. and Well, some do. Mine don't. Jean-Jacques Rousseau would say it's not, therefore, so much the understanding that constitutes the specific difference between man and brutes as it is the human quality of free agency, right? So it's the idea of free will is what makes you different. Uh, de Tocqueville would say, though man resembles the animals in many respects, one characteristic is pe peculiar to him alone. He improves himself, and they do not. So we have the capacity to improve our condition, John Stuart Mill, and being capable of sympathizing, not solely with their offspring, offspring or like some of the more noble animals with some superior animal that is kind to them, but with all humans and even with all sentient beings, and having a more developed intelligence which gives a wider range to the whole of their sentiments, whether self-regarding or sympathetic. So his idea is that you can be sympathetic and other animals can't. Modern times, like Darwin's The Descent of Men, would say there actually is no difference. Here's Here's a quote from Watkin, who then quotes Darwin, okay? Charles Darwin systematically dismisses the many hypotheses concerning human exceptionalism, arguing that, here's the quote from uh, uh, Darwin, the difference in mind between man and the higher animals, great as it is, certainly is one of degree, but not of kind, right? And that we have seen that the senses and institutions, the various emotions and faculties of love, memory, attention, curiosity, imitation, reason of that which man boasts may be found in the incipient or even sometimes in a well-developed condition in the lower animals. So Darwin's going to say there is no difference. Your, your mind's to a higher degree, but not of a different kind, because all those same qualities exist in animals as well. I could go on and on and on, but my point is, is people have wrestled with this for quite some time. And so creation account in Genesis comes in and says, well, here's what makes it different. You're created in the image of God. And so one of the first things that helps us understand that distinctiveness is this opening phrase, let us make. Now that's pretty remarkable. What does that mean, let us make? What's remarkable about it is that it is offered in the plural, right? It's not let, let me make, right? Or I'm going to make, it's let us make. So who is the us? And, and what does that teach us about the image of God? Well, a couple of things. Um, the first thing that I would say is that historically, um, people have tried to interpret this by saying that this is a reference to the Trinity. Uh, that's been a, 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 an interpretation that's been around for a long time. 
And, and I'm not completely against that. Let me tell you why. Uh, I do believe that we should read all the scripture through the lens of Jesus, right? And, and so on this side of the gospel, you can go back and that's where passages like Isaiah 53 and the suffering servant come to light. And so I don't think it's, it's uh, wrong or, or irrational to look at let us make and see a reference to a triune God that we have an understanding of because we live on this side of the cross. However, you can't stop there. Because the original author, the original audience, would have no idea about Jesus, the Spirit, Pentecost, or any of those things. And so the concept of the Trinity wasn't fully entrenched at this point in time. And so what did it mean to them? You still need to ask that question to get a better understanding of what is really being communicated here. And here are a few things. There, there are a lot of different options. The one that, that I tend to uh, agree with that I'll suggest to you this, this morning, we can look at other options when we gather together on Wednesday, is that this is God speaking to the royal court, right? So here's the idea, um, that he's essentially kind of turning to uh, heavenly beings and angels and those that are around him that are watching creation. It's like there's this audience behind him, and he's, he's putting it on display, and he's like, now let us make mankind, and he's making this announcement to them. Here's the biblical justification for that, right? While there's still some questions to it, there, here's the way that you can arrive there, is that if you were to consider the angels... While man is different than the angels, and there are a lot of biblical references that show angels and heavenly beings with a very different description than that of a man, there are numerous biblical examples of an angel appearing that is described as a man, especially in the Gospels. But the real justification for this, at least picture in your mind to me, comes from Job chapter 38. Uh, I love Job chapter 38. God's putting Job in his place. It's awesome. He's like, Where, who are you? Like, what, what do you think you get to do? Come criticizing me. And he's putting Job in his place. And he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And he's talking about creation. And as he's describing creations, he says, when I put the foundations of the earth together and I put the stars in the sky and the angels shouted for joy. And so Job kind of gives us this picture of God creating and the angels watching and shouting for joy. So another reasonable understanding of let us make could be, yes, triune God, but maybe God in making this announcement to the heavenly court, which is probably how the original audience may have heard it. But, but here's the meaning and significance behind it, uh, is this speaks to the plurality of the image of God. Right? I want to make sure that we, we grasp this. Here's what's so unique. And again, we're going to dive into this in a couple of weeks in greater detail. Um, God speaks to let us make mankind in our image. And then he references male and female. Now, he's made all the other animals. He's made all the other creatures, which based on our observations today, included male and female. But only now is he referencing us, which is an indicator that what he is doing to help communicate the plurality of the image of God is he's going to need male and female. Right? That he's entrusting the image to both and the relationship with one another is going to be important. That the image of God is an expression of the communal nature of our God. Right? That you were designed for community. Right? What is the one thing in creation that is not good. You might remember? Man to be alone. Right? And so, so there's this great quote um, from a Lucy uh, Pepiat who insists, here's what she says, it is not satisfactory to have a theology of the Imago Dei, the image of God, that is solely applicable to individuals or to individuals alone in their relation to God without an understanding of what this means for human beings in community. Together, we are God's image. God designed men and women to provide companionship to each other and work side by side in the world. Right? So the plurality of let us make is anticipating the plurality of male and female, indicating that our sense of identity and being made in the image of God is not something that you can find just in and of yourself. Right? That it's a communal expression. It's really powerful. We'll dive into that in a couple of weeks. Okay, again, we're just getting ingredients today. And so you have this really unique phrase, let us make. And that is paired with these subsequent descriptions here in the next few verses of image of God. Now, how do we understand image of God? Let me try to give a quick overview of this and then land the plane for us, okay? 
Uh, when you think about image of God and all the different ways that we've tried to identify what that is, there, there are so many different ways that it's been articulated, so many different terms you could use to describe it. In, in my studies, I ultimately came in with kind of three broad categories for us to consider this morning. One would be to say that the image of God is something that you actually possess, right, like that you have. So this would be the idea of a lot of what you see in those Western uh, expressions like the ability to reason or morality or even your physical nature that maybe the fact that you have two feet and two hands is representative of how God looks, right? But it's something you possess. And here's the problem with that. The, the, well, there's, there's a lot of different things, but as that thought process kind of worked its way into the Christian church, here was where it fell into a, a difficulty is how the fall impacted the image of God, right? So if, if it's something I possess, but then we've gone through the fall, then is, is it completely lost in me? And so the way that the early church fathers sought to reconcile that is they created a distinction between image and likeness. And essentially image was what was given to you that you never lose, likeness is what you lost in the garden. So you still have the image of God, but you're no longer like God. Well, the Reformation comes along and the Reformed thinkers push back on that and they said that doesn't seem to really resonate with the text. In fact, it, the fall has impacted all of us, like in, in all capacities. And, and so we really need to recognize that there is a total depravity that exists here. And so the image of God is not really about what you possess, it's more about your relationship to God. That there is a relationship that you had with God that has now been broken because of the fall and can only be restored through Christ. So that has some merit to it, but here's the shortfall to that is Genesis 9-6. Genesis 9-6 is God establishing this covenant with Noah. And he says, as he establishes this covenant with Noah, he's, he offers this kind of edict that you should not take the life of somebody else because that other person has the image of God in them. And so you have a post-fall covenant between God and Noah that says there is an inherent value in every single person because they have the image of God. So even though you're totally depraved, there's still some inherent worth and value. And so then a kind of new point of emphasis came along that really maybe this is about the future, that the image of God is what you're being made into, right? It's, what's, it's on the horizon. It's this dynamic relationship that it's going to be restored and all these things are going to be found. So you kind of had these three different broad categories of how people have wrestled with understanding what is the image of God. My, my main point for you today is it's pretty mysterious because the text doesn't clearly define it. I see elements of truth to all of it. If you want to know my personal opinion, I think it is something we possess. Maybe it is our physical nature. Maybe it is some of those things, right? I do think that it is about our relationship that has been lost and so hopefully restored through Jesus. I do think it is something that is pointing to our future. Right? I, I think it could be all of those different things. But the thing that I don't want us to lose sight of this morning is not so much how does this work and how do I specifically define it, but what's the meaning behind having it? Like, what is the significance? Here's what you can't lose sight of this morning. The image of God was given to you, right? It wasn't earned, right? You, you don't get to achieve it by the sweat of your brow. You don't get to achieve it by your work. And so because it's not earned, it cannot be lost. It is, it is a part of every single one of us. It was given to you. And when you reflect upon that gift, incredible things happen when you stop and reflect upon the fact that what was given to you was the image of God. Let's consider that in two different parts for a second, okay? What does it mean to, be given, to have been given his image? See, what that achieves for you is the ability to guard against kind of two ditches on either side of the road, image and of God. To know that you are made in his image ultimately keeps you humble, right? For your sense of identity, it, it prevents us from ever thinking of too highly of ourselves because what that means is that you are dependent upon something beyond yourself to find meaning and purpose because you are made in someone else's image. It doesn't come from yourself. There's another great quote. Uh, that brings this to, to a certain level of clarity that I'll read to you this morning. As soon as I find it. Well. Wow. 
I can't find it. <laughs> Either way, it's from, it's from John Stott. It's a great quote. I'll cover it with you on Wednesday. Here's the, here's the culmination of that quote. You are a spiritually dependent being, right? You have to depend on something beyond yourself. That's what it means to be created in his image. You have to be uh, mindful that you are dependent on something outside of yourself. You don't get to determine your meaning. That's so much of what we talked about last week. So being made in the image of something keeps you grounded, keeps you guarding from thinking too highly of yourself. It also frees you from the weight of trying to figure out how you, you get meaning and significance in your life and carrying that burden because you can look beyond yourself and find that significance. But at the same time, it's not just that you're in the image of something, you're in the image of God. You're the only thing in all creation that gets that designation, right? Watkin says it beautifully. He says, not, not a majestic sunset, not a waterfall, not the Amazon, nothing else gets the privilege of carrying the image of God but you. And so the image of God not just keeps you from thinking too highly of yourself but too lowly of yourself as well, right? It, it strikes this perfect resonance, this perfect harmony that makes sure that you have this anchor of humility and worth and value, right? That you are made in someone else's image. You look beyond yourself, but that image is of God. It's of your creator. It has inherent worth and significance and value and meaning. And so when we look at this, here's how I'll conclude. Here's what, what Grin uh, says. He says, the parallelism Parallelism of this allows us to see that image and likeness carry the sense of representation, right? Uh, what we see in, in ancient Near Eastern uh, theology is that at that point in time, kings would often take their image and they would place their image in different regions and territories that they weren't going to be physically present. And that image that would exist in these surrounding territories would be a sign and a marker of that king's majesty and power in that area. And so when you look at that, you can't help but think that these early readers, that's going to be in their mind when they hear the word image and likeness. And this becomes this idea of representation that Grins is talking about. They do not connote a mere aspect of the human person. It is rather in the whole of our being that we are somehow like God. The whole of our being. The image of God points more to our purpose than to our, the nature of our being. Although it may be multifaceted in its connotations, at the heart of the divine image is a reference to our human destiny as designed by God. We are the image of God insofar as we received in the past, are now fulfilling in the present, and one day in the future will fully actualize the divine design. And this design, here's what it is, is God's intent for us is that we mirror for the sake of creation the nature of our creator. Uh, Martha did a great job of bringing this illustration to the children, and that's the illustration I want to leave you with. N.T. Wright, Grins, Tim Keller, they all use this idea of a mirror. And N.T. Wright says it like this, that we should be an angled mirror, right? That you have been created, your sense of identity and purpose, being made in the image of God is that you have a unique capacity to represent the majesty and the glory of God to the rest of creation. And so the angled mirror, right, we can all take a mirror and we can catch the light from the sun and then we can angle it and direct it somewhere else and shine it in someone's eyes or whatever. And that's, that's the same concept, that you position your heart towards the creator that you might then fill the earth with his glory and his majesty as it shines through you. And that then you can take the praises of creation and offer them back to your creator, right? That that's what it means to be made in the image of God. And that has massive implications for what we're going to be talking about in the next few weeks. So my question for you this morning, church, is what are you facing? Like if your life and your identity is dependent upon finding something beyond yourself, then what are you angled towards? If your heart is positioned to anything less than your creator, you're going to fill the earth with something less than what it should be. Right, if you are angled towards your job, towards your family, towards pleasure, towards money, towards success, anything less than your creator, your sense of worth, your sense of self, your sense of purpose, and what you fill the earth with will ultimately be less than what it should be. But for the heart that comes before the Father and angles itself before God, we have this unique capacity 
to receive his glory and majesty and fill the earth with him. What does that look like? It looks like Jesus. Jesus shows us the way, guides us to doing that, and brings it to this perfect fruition. So my invitation to you as we continue through this series is to come before his throne rather than the things of the earth and marvel at his glory and his majesty and allow the praises of your life and the rest of creation to fill that throne room as we declare a hallelujah chorus for the fact that he has given us his image. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you and we thank you for who you are and all that you do for us. God, we pray that you would continue to watch over us today. Help us to never lose sight of this incredible gift of being made in your image. Um, God, we acknowledge that there are so many times we angle our hearts and position our hearts to lesser things. Help us to, this morning, once again, redirect them towards you. And I pray for any heart that is out there today that has maybe felt uh, too highly of themselves, God, that being made in your image would provide and the necessary humility that anchors us. God, that your spirit would convict us accordingly. And similarly, God, for anyone out there today that has maybe struggled to find a sense of worth and value and meaning and significance, may they be reminded that they've been made in the image of you and that there is this inherent worth and value, God, that your image would keep us from the dangers of hubris and the depths of despair as we seek to fill the earth with your glory. We love you, Father, for who you are and all that you do in our lives. We give you all the praise. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, let's stand and continue in worship. I'm going to invite the deacons to come forward, uh, that if you need a time of prayer, please utilize this time to do so. But let's come before the throne of God and offer him the praise for giving us all that he has through Jesus, his son.
Father, we give you praise. As we leave here today, help our hearts, our souls, and our mind be angled towards you, uh, that you would truly allow the image that you have given us to be given back to you, that we would fill the earth with your glory, God, and that you would allow us to rediscover the value and significance of what it means to be made in your image. We give you such praise and adoration for what an incredible gift you've bestowed upon us. We thank you, Father, for this time that we've been able to gather together in spirit and in truth and in worship and ask that you go before us, that you'd be exalted both today and forevermore. We love you, Jesus, and we pray this all in your precious and holy name. Amen and amen. Thank you all again for being here. Feel free to stop by and grab a popsicle on your way out, and we'll see you again soon. Have a blessed week.